We will have a talk by, uh, by uh, Swavomir Piazetsky, who will talk about uh, Python in astronomy. Please welcome Swavomir. Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is Swavomir Piazetsky, and I would like to talk uh, today about the Python in astronomy. Uh, why I choose this uh, topic? Well, for almost nine years, I was working in uh, astronomy field in the universities. Uh, and during that time I learned, uh, or I was introduced actually to the Python. Uh, and uh, right now I don't do astronomy that much, but uh, I'm working in a, a company that, it's, that, that, that uses Python in every, every day. So I thought that it would be nice to marriage these two topics uh, and my interest, interest in, in both of the fields and present uh, this, uh, this speech. So, what I would like to talk about uh, today, well, it would be like three points, it would be like introduction, what I would like to just briefly say about the astronomy itself, some uh, short uh, history of the astronomy, with uh, the points that for me are quite important, I think, in, uh, in the astronomy. I would like to briefly describe the, the package AstroPy, which is a um, package uh, dedicated for astronomers and astrophysics. Uh, that contains in one place most of the important uh, mo models and methods uh, uh, using in astronomy. And in the end, I would like to talk about Auto, which is a, a hybrid uh, software, um, Python and Fortran, that I was using during my, uh, my research in, in astronomy. Uh, okay, so let's start uh, with, uh, with the beginning. So, uh, as you probably know, the astronomy is one of the oldest uh, sciences uh, and the first observation was actually taken by the naked eye. So, the ancient uh, civilization like Babylons, like Maya, Greeks uh, or, um, I don't know, Egyptians, uh, they were using only just uh, the eye for uh, just to check what is happening in the night sky. and. Uh, what they are using this information? Well, they were using mostly for navigation, for um, creating uh, simple uh, calendars, for agriculture, for uh, religion purpose, uh, just to I don't know, manipulate the people, of course, because once you know where is the solar eclipse, for example, you can just say to the people that, uh, yeah, you have to pay us more because the gods are very angry on you. Uh, so. That was like the very beginnings of the astronomy, so actually wasn't that much science on it. But uh, the first uh, first civilization that uh, started to think a bit deeply about astronomy and giving uh, more important questions like uh, what is uh, what is exactly happening uh, above our heads? Why it's uh, planets moving this way, not the other way? And what is our um, purpose in the universe? So the Greeks start looking for these answers, and what they uh, what they achieved they achieved to estimate the distance between Earth and Moon, and Moon, uh, and uh, they introduced their geocentric uh, uh, system uh, that uh, put Earth in the in the center of the system, and all of the visible objects as planets, sun, and even stars were uh, traveling around the the Earth. Um, they also start to creating the, the first uh, astronomical catalogs of the stars and they were able to uh, find with a naked eye just uh, around thousands of uh, stars. They were able to precisely um, give the coordinates of, the, of each of the stars so you could easily uh, find out in, in some time uh, w when, we, w when you would like to uh, uh, search for, for, for these objects. Uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, uh, the Europe was not that much into the science because of uh, different things that happening uh, here, but uh, lucky for us, the Islamic world was really into, into the science. They, were, they really uh, put uh, far, uh, further the, um, the study in astronomy. They improve the, the methods of the observation, uh, they um, were able to discover a few galaxies uh, and uh, some supernova as well. And they also introduced quite a lot of uh, names and terms that are nowadays uh, using in astronomy. So, uh, but the first uh, revolution in astronomy, in my opinion, was actually uh, 
just changing the way of the thinking of, of the system, of the solar system ours. So uh, the Copernic, the Polish uh, astronomers, he decided to detronize the Earth and put in the middle the Sun. In this case, all of the planets will be uh, circular, uh, going circular around the Sun. And uh, with this model, it was much easier to explain uh, why the planets are behave like they behave right now. Uh, but that was just, uh, just the theory. He was not able to prove it uh, in the mathematical way or even observation, because at the time there was no any instruments. He was doing all of the observations still with a naked eye. But with help of that came the Galileo, who invited the lunette. And uh, one of the first objects he was looking on it was uh, Jupiter. And he discovered that uh, around the Jupiters are uh, small objects, the moons, that are uh, circular around it. So it was kind of proof that it's possible that uh, uh, around the biggest uh, objects uh, traveling are some smaller objects. So that kind of proof uh, uh, that Copernic had, Copernic had right, and, uh, and that around the sun, uh, it's possible that uh, all of the planets are uh, uh, silkering. Uh, Newton and Kepler just proved it, uh, this, uh, this model in mathematical ways. Uh, yeah, and uh, for the next uh, decades, uh, what was happening in astronomy was just improving the, the telescopes and uh, uh, and the method of, uh, of observation. And thanks to this, we were able to see deeper and deeper to the universe. We were able to discover more objects. We were able to create uh, a bigger catalogs of the stars that we know uh, until the photography was invaded. From that point, I think astronomy moved uh, very fast uh, in the discovery of new objects because we were not able only to um, point exactly the position of the object, but we were able also to uh, store uh, some information about it. So uh, as for a star, that it's quite easy because the star doesn't move that fast. But with the photography, we were able to detect some uh, near-Earth objects uh, that are passing uh, very fast and they are not that bright as a star, but we were able to capture them on the photography. So when you have like, I don't know, several uh, photography from different nights and you can see that some, sorry, some objects are moving, like tweeting, then you probably found some uh, asteroids that it's just passing by uh, the Earth. Uh, and the last, I think, revolution in the astronomy came with computers. Uh, of course, today we cannot imagine even uh, any science without computers because we do some uh, nasty, complicated uh, computation on it. Uh, we replace the analog uh, photography by digital photography. And yeah, we were able to send uh, even the telescope to the, to the space. That's why we uh, avoid uh, uh, lots of noises made it by uh, atmosphere and the Earth. And we are able to uh, yeah, see even deeper and discover very uh, rare objects in, uh, in the sky. Uh, so when we have a computers, we need also some programming languages. And in astronomy, uh, most important programming languages is uh, Fortran and C++. C++. Why those two? Because, well, they were made actually to uh, to do some numerical computation. They are very fast, they are very powerful, and because uh, they are quite long already in the use, we have a lot of uh, libraries uh, and a lot of software already is written. It's so many, uh, so many software in astronomy written in Fortran and C++ that uh, there is no even sense to trying to rewrite it into the Python or any other modern languages, uh, because it just will take uh, too much time. Um, okay, so I also ask some astronomers why they choose the Python. So I would like just to show you the, some results of the form that I sent to the uh, astronomers community. And one of the first questions I ask them is just why they choose uh, Python. So I think that it's not a really huge surprise that they choose it because it's a huge community. They can easily get any answer if they have any problems. Uh, 
there is quite a lot of uh, modules that they can use it and they love it because uh, yeah they get uh, tools to create the plots and um, before there was some software but uh, right now with a python they can actually customize as they want and as they wish and that's why they really love it uh, but what they are using for the, the Python. So yeah, one of the first thing and the most, uh, most answers were uh, answer was the drawing the plots. They really, they really use it for it. They use it some, uh, every single script for, I don't know, for backups, for maintaining some uh, everyday work. They doing for uh, some uh, simple um, scripts that are using just for, uh, uh, for the current work, of course, they're using also for uh, data analysis of the observation. And I heard also that some of the telescopes are controlled by the software written in, in Python. Uh, what are the uh, favorite uh, packages? It would be not surprised. It's a NumPy, CPy, Matplotlib for uh, drawing the plots, uh, Math, and AstroPy. And yeah, the next. Uh, I think I would like to talk about AstroPy because it's just uh, the package, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, concentrating all most of the important metals uh, in astronomy and astrophysics in one place. And but I would like not to talk about all of them because then I would need more, much more time. Uh, I would like just to show you a few of them and just slightly describe what for they can be used and why they introduced them to the AstroPy. So first uh, will be the units and physics and astronomics and astronomy. Uh, you cannot tell and describe any events uh, without uh, without units. You cannot say that someone is walking with a five because you don't know if he's walking five kilometers or he was walking five minutes or with a speed of five minutes of uh, five meters per second or whatever. So you need units just to finish the. Um, uh, just to, to fully describe the, the event. So in AstroPyte, if you import the submodule units, uh, you can get uh, most of the important uh, units in, uh, in astrophysics and astronomy, like meters, kilometers, Celsius, uh, uh, kilograms, uh, and, and so on. So once you call it uh, uh, units and meters, you get the object called unit, of course, and uh, with the name of meters. Mm. So I was thinking that it would be nice to show how does it work if we will just have a simple um, task to solve. Let's say that we would like to know how much time do you need to cover a distance of 15 kilometers if you are moving five meters per second. So let's introduce the distance. Uh, if we call it, we will get the object, which is quantity. Uh, and with the quantity, we have the information of the value and, of course, of the units. That's uh, what we can do with, uh, with these objects. Well, we can easily convert to this value to meters to any other uh, distance length. Uh, of course, we can multiply and divide it and so on and so on. Uh, so let's introduce also the velocity. The velocity, as I say, will be five meters per second. And yeah, it's not a rocket science, so if you want to know how much time do you need it? You have to just divide the distance by velocity. And the result of this uh, equation will be, yeah, three kilometers multiplied by second divided by meters. It's kind of weird uh, unit, right, for the, for the time. Uh, unfortunately, AstroPy have a problem with simplify the units. So if we have this kind of problems, we have to a little bit help him just calling the compose, and we will get, of course, the correct answer, which will be 3,000 seconds, which is 50 minutes. OK, so if we know how to uh, define the distance, I would like to talk about the distance in astronomy right now. Uh, in the Earth, we are using kilometers, miles, meters, and so on. We know how to uh, how far it will be five kilometers away from here, more or less, or uh, five miles. It's uh, but in astronomy, kilometers are not always that useful. I mean, we can use it for uh, nearby objects like satellites, like moon even, uh, but not, not much farther. I mean, the moon is uh, 
uh, and the nearest point is like 380,000 kilometers away, and the farthest way will be around 405,000 uh, kilometers. So you can see it's already kind of difficult to repeat this, this number, and this is not that far away in astronomy. Actually, it's just nothing. So uh, if we would like to see the distance between Earth and Sun, you can see it's like 150 million kilometers away, more or less. If I would like to repeat the number, yeah, I would have some problems with that. And because the astronomers like simple things, they just introduce a, a new unit, would be astronomical unit, which is uh, from the definition, the distance between Earth and Sun. With, uh, with this value, we can very easily uh, describe uh, distance between planets uh, from, uh, from the Sun or from each other. Uh, and it's just much easier to say this is like five uh, astronomical units instead of yeah, huge number of kilometers. Uh, but this distance, it's not good if we would like to travel in, inside our galaxy, right? Because, well, the nearest, uh, nearest star are away, like, uh, away, uh, far away from, from us, and we need a new, uh, new uh, unit, which will be light here, which could be also kind of confusing because from the very um, first point, if no one knows what is it, it could be like uh, the unit of a time. But actually it's a distance that uh, a light needs uh, to cover during one, uh, one year, uh, which is uh, yeah, around 63,000 astronomical units. Uh, but the light years are very nice for galaxy inside the galaxy, but we know already that there are other galaxies. So if we would like to travel to other galaxies, we need another, uh, another unit of, of the distance. And we came with a parsec, uh, which uh, from definition will be like 3.26 uh, light years. And with this unit, we can start uh, talk about uh, yeah, distance to galaxies, to quasars, to black holes, supernova, and so on. Okay, so I would like to show you why it's so simple uh, using astronomical units. As you can see on the left side, we have uh, uh, planets in the solar system. Earth is, of course, with a one. And yeah, it's just easier to say that Neptune is 30 uh, astronomical units away from the Sun than, yeah, I don't know, even, what is it, four billions uh, yeah, kilometers. And on the right side, we have the few of the nearest uh, stars in the light years. So if you can um, remember, one light year is uh, 3.26, uh, uh, no, it's uh, 63,000 uh, astronomical units. So yeah, for the Proxima Centauri, we need to travel like four years with the speed of the light to get there. Mm. OK. In astronomy and physics, you also need some constants. And these constants are also uh, introduced to the astropy. And I would like just to briefly show you two of them. One will be quite important, gravitational, gravitational uh, constant. Uh, so once you call it, so you get the value, you get the error of, uh, of this value. Of course, you get the units because we are operating with the units and uh, some reference uh, where, where uh, you can find the actual definition of, of this constants. And the second constant that I think it's kind of important in astronomy it would be solar mass. Uh, as you can see, the, the value is very, very, very high. Uh, and the sun, it's not actually a really huge one. And, and the universe is actually the, the average size of, uh, of the sun. So uh, if we discover any, any star and we, we are able to determine the, the mass of, of the star, we will use the units of the uh, mass of the sun. Okay, the, the next thing will be table. It's, uh, um, it's really nice uh, subclass using for, uh, for astronomy because we can start to um, do quite nasty computation with that. But to introduce the table, we need three, uh, three equal uh, lists of, uh, 
here uh, will be the integer, float, and, uh, and string, right? So this is the way how we, uh, we can introduce the table. And uh, we can uh, add the names of each of, uh, of the list. We can add some extra metadata to, to the objects. And if we will call it, we will get the information uh, about the length and how does it, uh, the table looks like. Uh, and what we can do with a table? Well, we can, from the beginning, just add the, the well-known units to one of the table, right? So let's set the unit. And if we will call it again, we will have the information that uh, uh, a second uh, columns uh, is with a unit of, uh, of seconds. So now we can start to multiply, divide it. We can start to do some uh, computation on rows, not only on the columns. Uh, it's kind of a lot of things to, to do with, uh, with a table. I think it's worth to have uh, five minutes and just check it, what probably you could use it for. Um, Okay, and uh, in astronomy, you cannot do any observation if you don't have any coordinate system. You have to have some points like uh, like Earth. We uh, in the Earth we have we have uh, uh, in astronomy we have uh, f uh, different uh, coordinates. Depends on the uh, on the telescope it's, uh, uh, that was created. So we can. Uh, uh, all of the all of the all of the coordinates are the, the spherical uh, in the spherical representation. Uh, the only difference between them is uh, the starting point of uh, of counting the, the angles. And here you have uh, several ways of introducing the uh, the coordinates thanks to the AstroPy coordinates. So we have uh, here uh, one, of, uh, one of the coordinate system that we can describe using the time, which will be like 42 minutes and, five, uh, and 30 seconds. And the second variable will be 41, uh, uh, 41 days and 12 minutes and, and so on. So what we can do, as I mentioned, what we can do with this variable, as I mentioned, we have different kind of uh, coordinate systems. So first of all, we can start to convert it to different representation. Uh, we can convert it to the Cartesian uh, representation and get the uh, well-known value of x, y, and z. We can also convert to the spherical uh, representation. We can also convert to uh, other galactic, uh, other uh, coordinate system. Here, uh, what I was using is a galactic, uh, uh, galactic uh, coordinates just to describe uh, uh, position of the galaxies in, uh, in, in the sky. Uh, what we can also do, we can also add a distance to the objects, and then when we call it uh, uh, the Cartesian representation, we will get the value and, and the value of the distance. Uh, the catalogs, uh, the catalogs are made for uh, some specific times. Uh, one of the most uh, popular time is for uh, the uh, 2000 years. So we have to represent the, represent the position of the uh, of the objects at the time that he would be able, he was be visible at the time of uh, 2000. Um, Thanks to this, we can later transform to other uh, epochs and check uh, at what time, uh, no. Uh, and we can uh, check that uh, the position of the object was completely different, like for example, here 50 years ago. So if we will just uh, print the coordinates of two systems, one in, in the epoch of 2000 and the second in uh, uh, in 1950, you can see that uh, the position of the object was slightly, slightly different. Mm. Okay, so the auto. This is the part of the work I was doing uh, when I was uh, uh, in, uh, in the field of astronomy. And the, the software is uh, a hybrid of Fortran and Python. Fortran do unfortunately most of the work. He's doing the computation 
and the Python is using just for uh, um, uh, communicate between the user and uh, and the Fortran. So with that uh, with that package, uh, we are able to uh, do uh, computation on periodic orbits. Periodic orbits are the solution of the equation that are repeating in some time, which will be easier to say that if we have an orbit and some object is spinning around it, uh, the periodic orbit will be the one that after some time of t, the object will come exactly to the same position with the same uh, value of uh, velocity and the same uh, direction. So thanks to this uh, um, software, we are able to check how the system is changing when we increase, for example, one of the value, uh, in this case, let's say the energy. So once we add a little bit more energy to the objects, the trajectory of, uh, of that object will change. And that, uh, that software helps us to find uh, these changes and put it as a, as a kind of the family of, uh, of, uh, of the periodic orbits. Um, in some points, we can have uh, several solutions for, for the same, uh, for the same uh, um, starting points. And these points are called uh, bifurcation points. So that will be looks like uh, if we represent uh, any uh, family orbits as a slide, uh, as a as a line, the periodic orbits will be just um, adding some branches to 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 the light uh, to this uh, to this line. Um, so in my work, uh, we choose one of the Hamiltonian, which describe the energy of the system. Um, by giving the um, position and uh, and the speed of the objects. On the left side, uh, uh, I, cho I choose to plot on the Poincaré section how could the orbits look like. So each dot represents one, uh, one periodic orbit. And uh, yeah, and as, um, what, the, what actually the, the plot is showing is that in this field we have, in these places we have peri uh, orbit periodic that are not stable. So after some time they, can, they can't lose the stability and there will be no any more periodic orbits. And in this position where we have some kind of structures, uh, the orbits will be stable. And even after thousands of years there will be still periodic orbits and nothing will change. On the right side we have the representation on the, on the coordinates of, uh, of the value of the energy. Uh, okay, so where is the place for Python over here? And the Python uh, is used, as I mentioned, just to communicate with, uh, with a Fortran. So what we have to do first, so we have to define the function, uh, which will be uh, the equation of motion of the Hamiltonian uh, that is described over here. So we have to take a, a derivative uh, of each of, uh, of variables and return the value to, uh, to the, to, from, from the function. We also have to describe the, the orbits, this first orbit that we are starting from. So we have to give some uh, initial condition and just start to compute to get uh, the whole, uh, the whole uh, uh, orbit uh, with the positions and velocities. And if we'll have this information, we can start and uh, do computation and we get some, uh, some results. So the results of, of this computation was getting this, uh, uh, this plot, which, is the, um, which represents the family of the orbits that we are able to find. Uh, so here also, it's each dot is a one uh, orbit, uh, periodic orbit, and as you can see, this is kind of evolution of uh, of, of this one orbit. Uh, here, the green is uh, stable uh, orbits, uh, red one, red one are unstable, and these plots are just showing like if we'd like to slice uh, in this energy, how the orbit looks like in the system. Here we have a chaotic uh, uh, orbits which are unstable. Here we have uh, a stable one. And this is just uh, the Poincaré section which uh, throw exactly the same. Uh, here we have uh, a slightly different uh, value of the energy. And yeah. So what I would like to do in my work, um, we were like looking for uh, finding the branches but not in the, in the flat, uh, in the flat uh, 
uh, images only to create the free, uh, 3D uh, maps of all of the branches. So we were start uh, to looking on this main uh, branch over here and it's representing over here and we start to check uh, how the orbit looks like. As you can see this uh, example is just showing all of the symmetrical um, periodic orbits that can be seen over here. We have one symmetry so uh, and going from one point to another we can see how the well we should see how the orbits uh, might change during, uh, during the evolution of, uh, of the orbits. Uh, so we knew it that in these points there is a bifurcation point uh, from which we will get more uh, solutions. So we could follow and those solutions and check how the, uh, how the new orbits will look like. So if we go to the next slide we can see that after the bifurcation points we lose the symmetry. It's the first thing that we were noticing. And the second thing is that just after bifurcation points we have only few orbits that are stable and all of them are unstable. What was also quite interesting that we have two different points but uh, actually they are kind of uh, common in, the, in this family, in the evolution of this family. And um, yeah, so that, uh, that what we get it from, uh, from, the astro, uh, from the auto packages and uh, yeah, that will be kind of all from, from my talk. So for the summary, uh, um, what I would like to say is just that Python is, is start to be more and more popular in, uh, in astronomy, mostly for um, teaching the students as the first uh, programming languages. Uh, they really, really love it for, uh, for droves of the plots and yeah, if, uh, if you are thinking that uh, the Python could be, I don't know, do some revolution in astronomy, it's mostly using as a plugins for existing software, just to I don't know, easier communicate with, uh, uh, with already existing software instead of writing a new one, because it's not that fast as Fortran or C++. So I would like also thanks to uh, colleagues of mine that uh, have a look on the um, on my presentation, give me some correction, and that will be all. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We have time for a few questions, a bit more. A bit more. Thank you very much for the presentation and a short introduction to astronomy. Can you please explain what's behind a parsec? I understand a light year is a parsec. Thing. Yeah, I can try to explain what is a parsec. Parsec is um, a distance of uh, astronomic units uh, s uh, seen as an arcsec uh, value. So you have to be uh, you have to be that far away from the Earth. So you can see the distance from Earth and, uh, and Earth as a one arcsec uh, value. So this is kind of um, def definition. It's kind of difficult to, yeah, to explain it, um, but uh, yeah, something like that. Okay, so it's just the, the angular? It's just the angular, yeah. Um, so I notice you're wearing an S STX Next T-shirt. Uh, are you working with astronomy still at your current employer? No, not anymore. I've been uh, one of the friends of mine trying to uh, give us some uh, work, but in the end it didn't happen. So at the, war at the time I'm just working yeah, as a developer. Any more questions? Um, well, really, really nice talk. Um, do you think uh, solutions as Cython, Numba, or these type of things are going to improve or uh, extend the use of Python in astronomy? Like GPU acceleration, I don't know. Because you said uh, it's used mainly as a wrapper for other Fortran or C++ things. Mm -hmm. uh, have you heard about you know, usage with Cython, Numba? 
Well, they, they, they use uh, SciPy and NumPy for some simple, uh, simple scripts that they can, uh, you know, they could use in different languages, but in Python it's just, you can write it much faster. So as far as I know, and what I was doing as well was just, you know, like simple computation that I just need for, I don't know, next day or whatever. That's, that's all what I can say. So if there are no more questions, thank you very much. Thank you.